So what I've learned is you really have to step your game up now if you're going to shine. This last unit that I purchased, I, I bought a Pac-Man machine, which is something I would have never thought about doing before. It was a $400 investment, but it's a really cool stand-up arcade Pac-Man machine. has a little stool with it. Since I've had that rent out, I've literally had guests, oh, I love the Pac-Man machine. It's only been a couple of months since I've had the property up and running, but I know for sure because people have told me that's why they booked the place was because they saw that Pac-Man machine. This is episode number four, six of the Short-Term Rental Success Stories podcast. Are you an investor that's looking to have your home professionally managed? Go to cohostit.com for more information. Welcome back to Short-Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journeys in starting and growing their short-term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that'll help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five-star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes and let us know what you enjoy as it really helps support the show. If you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation, to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Host Nation? I am super excited to be back again with you this week. There's a lot of stuff happening in the short-term rental space. We're finishing up January, which means that we are just about a month away from high season. We're also a month away from 50 episodes. That is so crazy. And I really can't keep this a secret from you guys anymore because I do want you all to start benefiting right away. We're coming into a season where people are going to be making a lot more money, and I want you guys to be making money too. So a few things that you should be looking out for in the next few weeks is one, John and I are going to be hosting a live training on starting and growing a rental arbitrage co-hosting business. So we like to talk about both sides of the coin because they are both really important in the short term rental space. If you're interested in starting your own vacation rental machine, we're actually going to be breaking down our formula for how you can actually do this. Two is that we've been getting a lot of requests to open up the BNB Empire Builders Mastermind Group again. And guys, we will be opening that back up again. Maybe it's going to be happening during March. We'll see. High season. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. But I do want to open that back up because I I like talking with you all. And it is such an awesome community to be able to talk with everybody one on one and a little bit more personally and see everybody grow. We've seen so much growth in the group so far, and people are really making big leaps and bounds in their BNB empires. And then three is co-hosted, obviously. I'm super excited for the returns that we're going to be able to see for our investors. Imagine having a rental arbitrage unit that you just have to put the money down and somebody else manages it for you. It's really the best of both worlds. And if you want to find out more information about our turnkey rental arbitrage program, then go to cohostit.com for more information. But in this episode, I had the special honor of speaking with Joel Edwards. Joel has been short-term rental investing in Phoenix, Arizona since 2012, but transitioned to becoming a full-time real estate investor and real estate agent in 2015. Joel owns five condos, has one rental arbitrage unit, and four co-host clients, and recently started to rent out two rooms in his own home. Joel got into short-term rentals accidentally when he and his wife were going on an extended vacation to Europe and Peru. Joel asked one of his friends who had an Airbnb and was successful to see if they could take care of his empty property while he was away. And three months later, Joel came back from his trip with more money than he left before. So he knew that he was onto something. In this episode, Joel talks about a lot of the practical things that you can start implementing in your business to be successful and to stand out from the competition. If you like my show notes or anything else we talked about in this episode, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash str46. Or if you'd like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, Host Nation, to another episode of Short Term Mental Success Stories. In this episode, I have the special honor of speaking with Joel Edwards. Joel, would you please let the audience know who you are and what inspired you to get into short term rentals? Yes. Uh, hi. Thanks, Julian, for having me. My name is Joel Edwards. Um, I've been doing short-term rentals now since 2012. It really was by accident. Um, My partner and I were going on an extended vacation to Europe and to South America. And we had a condo that we owned and it was furnished. So I had some friends that were doing vacation rental units and I asked them if they would take care of my property for me and manage it. They said they would. Long story short, uh, three months later, I came back with more money than when I left before. So I knew I was on to something. So when I came back, I bought another condo. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and just took it from there. So So you you started 2012. You just you had a fully furnished place, but you were going to be gone for how how long were you gone? We're going to be gone for about three and a half months. So we were going to be leaving mid-January and coming back about mid-April. And it just so happens that's the peak season here in Phoenix. Uh, That's when we have spring training, spring training baseball, 
um, golf tournaments, everything's going on. Everybody wants to be here. Um, so it was just great timing for that. Did you know going into that, that, that would be a profitable thing? Like, how'd you even know to price it? And, um, was there a lot of competition in the area at that time? So 2012, it definitely was not like it is right now in 2019, seven years later, there's a lot more competition. So back then I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about pricing, but I had a friend, uh, him and his wife, they had three vacation rental units and they were just neighbors of mine actually. So that's how I was just a casual neighbor talking to them, seeing how they're doing. And then I asked them if they would be open to managing it for me. So they came up with the pricing structure. They did the cleaning for me. They did everything. And th I just paid them a percentage. So I said, okay, well, whatever money comes in, they invoice me at the end of the month. And that was it. That's pretty much how it was. So it was totally hands off for me. I didn't have anything to do with it. I was in Peru for six weeks and then I was in Prague for six weeks. Wow. So, so while you were away, you, you came back with more money than when you went on the trip and then something clicked and you're like, wow, th there's, there's something here. What, what was the next progression with that? Yeah. So, so when I got back, I got back around April, May, somewhere around that time of 2012. So then that summer of 2012, it was still, there still were lots of foreclosures and short sales here in the Phoenix market. Um, my background is real estate. I've been in real estate since 2005, I started off in California and then came out to Arizona in 2009. So Phoenix was hit really hard during the recession. There was lots of foreclosures everywhere you look. So I had saved up a little bit of money and I was looking, I wanted to be in the general area of where I already lived because I knew it was going to be easier for me to manage the property. So uh, I found a one bedroom, one bath, and it was a short sale. And I was able to buy that property for approximately $51,000. So it was really, really dirt cheap. Um, and I went there, I bought the property. It was a relatively fast closing, closed in about 30 days. So it was fall of 2012. And I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I knew it worked for my property when we were gone. So I said, okay, let me test it out. So I literally took all the furniture that we had at the condo we were living at. And I kind of just took it over to the new property and then bought us new furniture just in case it didn't work. Okay, hey, I just I lost some used furniture. I bought like a futon, you know, used table, used everything pretty much. I, I decorated it pretty sparsely, but as good as I could do at that time. And same thing at that time, I I actually started working with another company, um, Evolve Vacation Rental, and because I was working full time doing real estate, helping buyers and sellers. So I didn't really I hadn't dealt with any of the guest communication. I know the time that would take. So I started off working with them for a few months. And it was great. I'd get an email and they tell me I have a reservation and they give me the dates and everything. And then I was the one doing the cleaning. I was the one doing the turnover. And I did like working with them, but I felt like I could do this. And I wanted to save more money as far as the percentage that I was paying them. So that spring of 2013 is when I took over and I had a great spring. I had a great spring training. I probably was rented out about 90% of the time. And I was excited about it. And in that same complex, there was a unit that became available. And I bought another one, another one bedroom, one bath condo. And I bought that one for around $58,000. And it just kept going from there, um, where I've been trying to add one every year or so. Yeah, you have you have seven properties that you own now for the your co-hosting and you just picked up a rental arbitrage property. What what's what's pretty interesting though is you you got started really, you know, pretty pretty early and you were picking up these properties, but you weren't how were you analyzing these properties? Did you know the numbers were you using comparables? Having a real estate background, I imagine that you maybe had a little bit of an advantage. Uh how what were you doing to be able to analyze these deals though? Yeah. So just from the perspective of having that real estate background, I definitely had comparables to know I wasn't overpaying for any of the properties that I was buying. So that part was easy because with the MLS, I had everything set up where I could run comps. That part was simple. Um, as far as pricing on the vacation rental side of it, I would just look at the competition. I would look at the area that I was in and look within about a mile or two radius for similar properties that were comparable. And I would just normally when I would start off because I don't have any reviews, I was having, I was usually priced about 10 to 15% below the market. Um, and then I would try to get my reviews. And then once I had about three or four reviews, then I could know that I could increase the price and just go from there. So it was basically just looking at the competition through VRBO, um, Airbnb, FlipKey, TripAdvisor, using all of those sites. I'd even check out local hotels um, because of the fact that I had one bedroom, one baths. They were somewhat comparable to what a hotel room may be. 
Um, so I was just looking at all those and just putting the numbers into the system. And if it works, I would know I, because I get bookings, I get occupancy. If I was a little bit higher, then I would just um, bring the prices down. And I was very active with the pricing, looking at it um, actively. How how big of a difference was it when you transitioned? Because you were using a property manager at first for that first property. The yep. second property, you started using Evolve, uh, but you were still doing some of the some of the management yourself. But then you realized that that you could probably do this business maybe better yourself. Uh, yeah. How was that transition from going from using a property manager to managing it fully yourself and also scaling that business? Sure. Um, it went relatively smooth. And when I say that relatively smooth is because I'm a very hands-on person. So one of the challenges for me personally was just kind of letting go. Because as I mentioned, I knew, I was doing all the cleaning myself. When I first started, I actually was meeting guests. I was meet I was meeting the guests there, showing them everything, giving them a tour. And with my, my background in real estate, you know, I loved it. It was great. I got to meet people from all over the world. I had Canadians, people from Europe coming all over. And I'd spend 30, 40 minutes at a time answering the questions. But I realized that if I was going to scale this to any degree, I couldn't meet everyone in person. I couldn't do all the cleaning. I was taking laundry home, finishing it there because sometimes I'd have a same day turnover. So I, I realized relatively soon that in order for me to scale this, in order to be successful at it in any degree, I would have to kind of let some of those things go. So that's when I hired a housekeeping service and I have a couple of housekeepers now. So that was really um, big for me of, of being able to do that and realize that. So 2012, you had your first property. 2013, you purchased your second property. And then by 2015, you had 10 properties and you were going full time at this. What happened within those two year period? That's a, that's a big progression. Yeah. So what happened is I, I picked up a couple of clients. So co-hosting. So of those properties, of those 10, four of them are co-hosts. And then I own six. And then the rental arbitrage, that was something that was new. It really was because I was making a pretty good profit from each property and I'm good at saving. So what I was able to do was just go ahead and, you know, save up my money and then go get another one, go get another one. So the goal was to try to get one or two a year. Um, and it was just from taking the profits from that and from real estate and then just going to go get another one. And the price points were so friendly here in Phoenix is what made it possible. You know, it's not like I'm from California originally. So you can't go in California and buy a property for $50,000. That just w would never happen. So I think it was just really lucky. I was really fortunate to be here at a time where the price points were still re relatively low to enter and to purchase. What what was the what would be the difference of return? So let's say because you started pretty early and picking up all these properties in a time where Phoenix uh, wasn't as um, the prices weren't as exaggerated as they are right now. Sure. Um, what what was the price that you could get as a long term rental tenant though, uh, compared to what you were making as a short term? You know, even back 2013. Sure, they weren't even close. You can make so much more money in short term rentals. I, I knew, even though I'm in real estate, I knew I didn't want to be a landlord. And the reason was because I'd worked with so many clients. I worked with investors who the profit margins were so thin that at the end of a 12 month lease, if the tenant messed up the property, you know, paint, uh, carpet, all of those type things, that's your profit. You know, in the 13th month, you have to get it ready for the next person. So I knew that didn't really fit my personality uh, for the amount of risk and for the return. So that's why I fell in love with the short term rentals is because, so your question was, how much is the rent? So a one bedroom, at that time, a one bedroom, one bath in Phoenix would rent for about eight to $900 per month. In 2012, I was renting the unit out for approximately a hundred bucks a night. And I was getting, like I say, about 90% occupancy. So I was making $2,500, $2,600 a month versus the 800, making three times as much money and it fit my personality great because the way I had my cancellation policy, I was getting paid 60 days in advance. I didn't have to chase anybody around for money. There was very low wear and tear on the property because most people, as you know, they're just looking for a place that's safe, clean. They're going to go there, maybe have some breakfast, watch CNN, and then they're out. They're going to go explore. They're going to go see what Phoenix has to offer. They're going to spring training, Grand Canyon. They're back in the evening, a shower, get some rest. So very, very low wear and tear. So it just fit my personality perfect. And it was triple the money. So it's kind of like a no brainer. Wow. 
I, that's pretty crazy because that's what people think when they're getting into the space and they want to get into short term rentals. They're they're looking at that twenty five hundred dollars versus the eight hundred dollars. Right. Uh, but is that is that something that any investor can get into, or uh, was it because that you uh, were managing it yourself that you were able to make these numbers possible? I think it was a combination. I think anyone can do short term rentals if you have the right personality for it. If your customer service driven. Um, it's not really, it's not really a real estate business in that sense. It's more customer service. It's how do you deal with people? How do you handle objections? How do you handle conflict? And so you always have to be able to say, okay, put yourself in the position of the customer and trying to go that extra mile. If you don't have that personality, if you're really worried about the small stuff, like, oh, they lost a spoon, they lost a fork. How could they do? It's probably not going to fit your personality. It may be best just to get a property management company. And you just get an invoice and a statement at the end of the month. And you don't know what's going on the day to day. It fit my personality because I've been doing real estate. So I know all about customers, how to handle different people and how to work with people to achieve what it is that they're looking for. And I always come from the perspective of, I know people work very hard for that two week vacation. So I want to try to provide the best value for them and also provide the best customer service. And nothing's going to run perfectly. Um, so when there are those issues that do come up, try to resolve it as quickly and as easily as possible for the guest, not even about myself, but what's going to make them happy. And most of the time, they just want to be listened to. They want to be heard what's, you know, that there, if there's a complaint or there's an issue. Um, so that's why I really try to focus on. But I think anyone can do the business, whether or not they can manage it themselves. Maybe, maybe not. It did fit my personality pretty well. Yeah, I love I love what you said, and that's something that we always preach on on our other show, Vacation Rental Machine, is that this is such this is not a real estate business. You know, there there are components to real estate, but this sure. is so much more hospitality. And you, like what you said, having the personality to be able to do this uh, is really what allows you to be able to reach those numbers. And going off of that, you you've seen Phoenix really grow, and the prices have increased, and probably a lot more people are coming into the market as short term rental hosts. Uh, what 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 does the numbers look like now? Is it still a green market? Is there still a lot of profitability, or is it a little bit too, too oversaturated now? And there's uh, the rents too high, uh, too many too much competition. What what's your perspective on that? My take on it is that there's always going to be opportunity. Definitely 100. percent From where I started in 2012 to where it's at today, it's definitely much more saturated. So I just have to change with the times. So for example, this past summer. I bought uh, another condo. I bought a two bedroom, two bath condo that cost me $160,000. So you can see prices have tripled since in the last seven years, but that one cost me $160,000. I put another $20,000 for renovations into the property, um, head to toe, new flooring, new paint, uh, new, new countertops, brand new appliances. So what I've learned is you really have to step your game up now if you're going to shine. Because there are lots of properties out there, you can click on them, and the pictures aren't done by a professional photographer, or the bed linens are messed up. All of those things that you could have gotten away with in 2012 and still been profitable, it's not going to happen now. Definitely not. That's not what I see. What I see, especially with Airbnb Plus programs, VRBO has the Premier Partner Program, all of those things, you have to really step your game up. You have to have these moments, these social media moments for people now. Um, this last unit that I purchased, I, I bought a Pac-Man machine, which is something I would have never thought about doing before. Um, I picked it up at Costco. It was a $400 investment, but it's a really cool stand-up uh, arcade Pac-Man machine. has a little stool with it. Um, so I put that little investment there and put it in the corner for people that play Pac-Man. I felt like, okay, that's going to relate to my seniors because I do get a lot of senior citizens and seniors that are coming down during spring training, but it's also going to relate to younger people that want a video game. I bought a record player that plays 45 records and it's also a Bluetooth. I picked that up for 40 bucks. So just those little things, it's not a lot of money. It's $450 investment, but those are kind of my two little things to, and I, when I, when I hired my photographer, you must have professional photography. If you're not doing professional photography and you're not investing that hundred to $125, depending on what your market is in a professional a photographer, you're doing yourself a total disservice. So when I had my photographer there, I asked him, highlight these things, highlight the Pac-Man machine, highlight the record player. And there are so many things that you can do um, that are one-time costs, because that's the main thing for me. If I can have my one-time cost, that's fine, so long as it's not a recurring monthly cost. 
And I've had my, I've, since I've had that rent out, I've literally had guests, oh, I love the Pac-Man machine. That's the reason I picked your place. And that's what I had envisioned for that based upon that simple investment. Wow. So have you been tracking that and have you gotten that return on investment back? Definitely. Definitely. It's only been a couple of months since I've had the property up and running, but I know for sure because people have told me that's why they booked the place was because they saw that Pac-Man machine. I actually had one guest that I met in person and he said, man, they took me back. You know, they took me back to the mid eighties. It was so much fun. And he probably was in his, you know, fifties or something of that nature. So he really enjoyed it. Um, So it was great. Wow. I, I love I love that, Jewel. And I think that's just so cool because that really is making the point that you're doing things to be able to stand out. Um, it, is this moving forward, though? Is is it going to be putting in, let's say, those record players and those Pac-Man machines that's going to make you be able to stand out? If you just kept your properties the same, do you think that you'd be able to do as well as you did prior? No, I wouldn't be able to do as well if I just kept everything the same. It's definitely that's the minimum bar for me now is to have at least a couple of focal points that can be highlighted there. It's some type of entertainment. I think it's a given now, you know, it's a given everybody has smart TVs. That used to be something you could distinguish yourself with a few years ago. Oh, I have a smart TV with Netflix and, you know, Hulu. Everybody has that now. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's mounted. Okay. Everybody mounts their TVs now. You know, those things are all pretty standard. You should be having those. You should have your TV as a flat screen. It should be a smart TV, comfortable beds. Everybody's going to have comfortable beds. Everybody has Casper and all these different companies out there that are relatively affordable. And everybody knows you should have these comfortable beds and comfortable couch and dining. To me, those are just the bare minimum. So I think the things that you can do to stand out, whether that's video games or that's record player, if you have the space for it, ping pong table, make it a game house, you know, not where you're going to have a party, but maybe Monopoly games and, uh, you know, chess and checkers and all these things, whatever you can highlight just to say, hey, I'm a little bit different. This is why you're going to choose me as opposed to my neighbor that has everything I have, but doesn't have A, B or C. Being a real estate agent and also purchasing a lot of properties yourself, you're, you're probably really familiar with what the market, um, you know, where the market is. Are you specifically targeting short term rental properties when you're working with clients? Are you working specifically with vacation rentals? So, no, I have all types of clients so on the real estate side of it. I help out buyers. I help out sellers, people that may be looking for a second home or even people that are looking for their primary residence. Um, however, when it's specifically short term rental clients that I'm working with, then yes, I can definitely gear them in the right direction as to which complex is going to be friendly to it, which homeowner association is going to be friendly to it, which ones to stay clear of because they may have certain things in the CCNRs with restrictions as far as 31 day minimum uh, rental, things of that nature. So it's, uh, it's, it's both. And what, what are you looking for specifically with properties now uh, when you're planning on purchasing them that would make sense as a good short term rental? What I look for are amenities. If I'm purchasing in a condo complex, which is everything that I have right now, I haven't ventured into the single family residence yet. But what I look for at minimum are a pools, a gym, clubhouse would be nice, uh, things of that nature, barbecue, uh, clubhouse, all of those little extra amenities that you're going to have an HOA fee, but at least you're getting something in return for that. Because that's usually, especially when people come to Phoenix, that's what they're thinking about. They're thinking about the pool, the hot tub, you know, uh, palm trees, those type things. So having those nice amenities to say, okay, this is the space. But now when you're outside, you can go to the pool. It's a heated pool, a hot tub, barbecue area, loungers. I think all of those amenities are a must. I would never purchase something. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm sure everybody, it works for different people. But I wouldn't personally buy something or recommend something that didn't have at least those bare amenities that the community offers. Good location, close to the airport, that type of thing. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people are doing? Because uh, Phoenix in uh, Arizona, it's 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 pretty short term rental friendly. Uh, and you're talking about like HOAs and and, uh, you know, condos. And those are places that, you know, the rest of the U.S., they're like, oh, stay, stay away from those places, stay away from, you know, certain states. Um, but have you noticed that because it is so friendly there that people are coming into the market um, and maybe picking up the wrong properties or doing things wrong. What, what's, what's your perspective on short-term rentals in the Phoenix area because it is so friendly? Yeah, so I think that you there are a lot of people that have jumped into it, have jumped into the vacation rental market because like you said, Phoenix is very friendly to it. I think some of the things that they could possibly be doing wrong is pricing. I feel like sometimes they're pricing too low, honestly. I think that sometimes they're jumping into it and they may have been coming from an investor's perspective where they're used to $1,000 a month in rent. 
So if they can get $1,500 or $1,600, they may be leaving money on the table. I think sometimes not having a professional property manager or some type of insight into pricing, you can leave money on the table. I also think that bringing up professional photography, I think that from, I look at lots of Airbnbs and I'd say only about 20 or 30% here in the Phoenix market appear to have those professional photographs. Lots of them, they look like it's just on the cell phone, uh, that type of thing. Response time, it's key. When I look at the competition, sometimes I see on there, they get back within 24 hours and that's just way too long. And maybe that's because they have a full-time job. Maybe that's because they have a family, they can't respond. Um, so I think that I know for sure that the reason that I keep my occupancy so high for myself and for my clients is before even Smart b and as we talked about, I've just been using that for the last couple of weeks. Before all of that, I would respond to people on average within about seven minutes. That's just being on my own. Because as soon as someone sends me a message, I'm responding. I'm giving them something. Hey, even if I'm at a movie, you know, I'm that guy that will pull the pull my jacket over so it doesn't disturb anybody else. But I'm, you know, I'll let them know, hey, I'm in a movie right now, but I'm going to respond to you shortly. I did get your message. But that was before Smart B&B, so now I don't have to worry about doing that. Um, but response time, you're not responding to people within 10 minutes. I do believe you're leaving a great percentage of revenue and profit off the table. You know, you think, oh, I'll get back in 30 minutes. Is good enough. No. Whoever responds to that client first, usually is going to be able to have a higher probability of getting that booking, which is going to result in more nights, more money, more probability. So those are the top three things I would say you have to do in order to be successful at it um, and be successful. And you've, you've got also a diverse portfolio. You, you do co-hosting, you have a rental arbitrage unit and, and you own. Can you give some perspective on the uh, different models and which is the one that you prefer? Sure. I'm, a, I'm in real estate, so I love owning things. I think that rental arbitrage is great. I I really do. But I do like owning property for the equity that you can get potentially if the home appreciates. I like that. The tax incentives are writing off the tax insurance. I like that. And ultimately, if it is a down market or if something should happen in rental arbitrage, if apartment houses become less friendly to that, at least I still own this piece of real estate that I can sell, that type of thing. So I say primarily I like owning things. I'm an owner. However, For return on investment, if you're just looking at straight ROI on your money, I think rental arbitrage is the way to go. Uh, This past summer, I got my first property and I was able to furnish that property for five to $6,000, which is very affordable. I have my lease. I right now for the month of January, I have approximately $5,000 of bookings coming in for January, 2020. And my rent at that property is $1,200 a month. Yep. $1,200 bucks a month. I signed a five-year lease. This is a private homeowner. Uh, so I signed a five-year lease with this gentleman um, because he was looking, he, he knew that, oh, that's great. I get somebody in here for five years. He didn't have to have that turnover. So my, my rent there's uh, $1,200 a month with internet, electricity, um, Netflix, that type stuff. It's another two two fifty. So my break even on that is about $1,500 per month. Um, I divide that by 30 days. So I'm looking at about $50. So anything over $50 a day is profit. January, I'm renting out approximately $175 to $200 per night. February, March, same way. So during those three months, it's going to pay almost for the entire year's worth of the rent. And then in the summertime, the goal, again, prices are going to drop drastically. But if I can break even and then just wait for those months, get my reviews up. I think I have about 10 reviews now on Airbnb. Um, I'm a super host on Airbnb. So all those different type things help. So for my $6,000 investment, I'm not a mathematician, but it's going to be a much higher return than my $180,000 that I spent on the property that I bought and renovated. So I think every model can work. It just depends upon what you want to do, what your exit strategy is, all those type of things. I love it all. <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, no one that you know now with the rental arbitrage model, uh, is that something that you would double down on or are you still kind of keeping ju- that as just maybe a way of taking that money and then diverting it into uh, your own uh, owning them? That's a great question. So I'm actually in communication right now. Last weekend, because the rental arbitrage is, went, is going so well with that first property, which is a two-bedroom, two-bath, 
I went to six different complexes in the Phoenix area, that's Ryan area, and just pitched them, you know, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm looking to do. And I got five no's, but I got one yes. Um, so I've been in communication actually this morning with that complex trying to come to terms with uh, what the monthly rent would be there to try to make it work. And I, I was just honest with them. I told them, you know, this is where I need my numbers to be because they were slightly above where I wanted it to be. So seeing if they would negotiate something, I even offered to pay three months in advance if that would kind of sweeten the pot. So rental arbitrage is definitely something that I will add to. Um, I don't see there's there's no reason not to add to it. And I think it's just another way to diversify. Um, I think it's, that's that's the way I look at it. And in that in that market, because, you know, Arizona, Phoenix, it, it is such a friendly market uh, for short term rentals. Ha- has has that gained a lot of attention of a lot of people that are trying to, you know, uh, take advantage of that or using these types of models like rent uh, like rent uh, subleasing? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has. And historically, Arizona has been very friendly. But I just read an article that in the new year in January, I guess it's going to the state legislature. There have something on the ballot with regards to short term rentals and maybe limiting days or something. So it hasn't been voted on yet. Uh, Knock on wood that they still remain friendly to it. The governor has maintained that he wants to be pro business and friendly to short term rentals. So I'm I'm hopeful that it will continue that way. Um, But it definitely has brought a lot of people to the to the market for that. Also, your perspective on co-hosting. How how has your uh, relationship been with uh, co-hosting and the clients and, and the returns on that as well? It's been great. So I have three clients. I have one client that's on the East Coast in Maryland, and they're wonderful people, a husband, and wife, and they they have a couple of units that I helped them purchase last year, and they rent those properties out, and I do the co-hosting for them. And then I have two other clients. Uh, one client has a two bedroom, two bath. The other client has a one bedroom, one bath. So that's been great as well. Um, the the model that I have with them is I do everything. I just invoice them at the end of the month. So I handle all the guest communication. I handle all of the supplies. I handle housekeeping coordination, guest communication reviews. So it's totally hands off for them, which I think is great uh, for them because that's what they wanted. They wanted something that would kind of just run for them as a machine. And the way that I work, I look at those properties as if they're my very own. So the same eye, the same eye to detail. When I look at it, I give it the exact same care, the exact same detail, because I know that I take pride in what I do. And I know that the, if I want somebody to do the same thing for me, you know, it's a win-win that the best job that I can do for them, it's going to get more revenue for them, more revenue for me. So that's the way I look at those properties. And I love the co-hosting. I think it's, a, again, it's another way to diversify. I think that any way that you can diversify yourself in this day and age when it's so easy to do so, there's so much opportunity, whether that's owning, rental arbitrage, co-hosting, you can make it. You can, that's, you know, that's something for all the listeners out there. Don't study things too hard. Don't overthink things too much. Do it. You know, do your research for sure if you if you have that personality, but ultimately you have to pull the trigger. You have to go out there and you try it. And I think for somebody that's limited on cash, I think rental arbitrage is a no-brainer. That's the way to go. Um, you know, if you don't have the money to do it or you can't qualify for a loan, that's a great way for you to do it. But I think big picture from those revenues, I would always recommend investing in real estate. Buy something, buy land, buy an condo, buy a house, duplex, um, all of those things. But there, there comes a point when you can only own so many properties and then you have to, you know, because uh, you, are you are you taking all of these with cash or are you uh, getting loans on these? So I've been fortunate enough that the condos I've been able to buy at a price point where it afforded me the opportunity to buy them all cash. So I've been very, very fortunate with that. So those properties are owned free and clear. There's no mortgage or anything of that nature on those. And then the co-hosting, you know, obviously I don't own the properties there. So Phoenix market has been very good to me. Would you, would you keep on doubling down in the Phoenix market or would you be open to going to new markets as well? You know what? That's a great question. Um, at one time I went to Florida, this was about three years ago. I went to, um, I went to Orlando. I also went over to Tampa cause they have spring training. So I went to a few different cities. And the price points at that point a few years ago were very similar to where the price points would be for Phoenix. And I considered that market, but I don't know anyone there. I didn't know anyone there and I still don't. Um, So I would be open to it for the future. I'd never say never, but it's not something I'm actively looking at right now. What has been the most challenging part of scaling your short mental business? 
I say the hardest part is finding good partners as far as housekeeping and cleaning, um, because I don't do any of the cleaning myself unless there's like an emergency or if it's a really, really busy time, then I'll jump in. But the hardest part is really finding a cleaning service that's reliable, somebody that's going to do a good job, have that attention to detail, because that's what guests are looking for. That's the main thing when they're going there. If they walk in there and they see a hair on the bathtub, it could be a great property with everything else. But if they see that, that's going to give you a four star review instead of a five star review. You get enough of those, you know, it's just negative all the way around. So I think really finding the right partners, whether that's housekeeping, uh, handymen that are reliable, that can be there. That's been the most challenging part for me. And I've been very fortunate over these years to work with some very great people. And is there anything that you're doing to be able to uh, have your guests leave positive reviews? Yes. Um, so one of the things that I do, and I, it's something is just implementing, I check in with them the day after they check in. So that right after that morning when they wake up, I have an email waiting for them and I just am asking them, hey, you know, hope I see everything. I hope everything's going well, that you checked in smoothly. So that I feel that little extra touch that shows that you really care. Um, another thing that I like to do is when the, the day before that they are checking out, I just send them a quick text or message through Airbnb, thanking them for their visit, just giving them the, the reminder, friendly reminder of the checkout time and also welcoming them back. So those are two key points. And then after they check out, usually Airbnb will send a uh, request for a review. And I just ask them, you know, if, they're, if they have time to leave a review, that would be great. And I tell them what my goal is. I say, you know, my goal for each guest is to try to earn a five-star review. And hopefully I did that in your case. And if there's anything um, that I can prove upon, let me know. But I do use the word earn and not, not give it to me. And I wanted to go back on something real quick because it, you've been, you know, just realizing that you've been full-time uh, short rental property managing for nearly five years now. What, what, is, what is a day in the life of a full-time for five years look like? It's a long day. Um, I'm all, you can ask my girlfriend, I'm always on. And what I mean by that is I'm very attentive to my guests and what it is that they need, what it is that they want. So usually when I wake up in the morning, I check my email inbox, uh, check Airbnb, VRBO, Flipkey. Um, usually it's a good morning when I wake up and I see that there's money that's there waiting, that I had a reservation that came in. So it's just responding to those guests, thanking them for their reservation, checking to see, um, and I have all this automated now, uh, but just checking to see what time they would be arriving, what time did they, would they be checking out, um, if they need an early check-in, early check-out, that type of thing, asking for their contact information, uh, what brought them to the city, what brought them to Phoenix. And I use all of those things. So for example, I'll give you a perfect example. I have a guest last week. Her husband, unfortunately, had a stroke. Um, so she was here with her husband and they live locally, but they live in the East Valley. They live like in Chandler and his uh, treatment was going to be taking place closer to where I have one of my condos. They stayed with me for about 13 nights. And she told me that they're in because I asked, oh, what brings you to town? Because not everything is a happy vacation. So I wanted to know wh what the reason was. And she told me that her husband had a stroke. And so I told her, you know, I'm really sorry about that and hope that he has a speedy recovery. And I related to that because my father, I have past experience, my father had a stroke back in 2013. So I sent her a personal message and I just told her, you know, I know that um, having a stroke can be difficult, not only for the stroke victim, but also for the loved ones. I said, so, you know, I really just want to commend you for taking care of your husband. Tell your husband to stick in there, uh, you know, with all the treatment, occupational therapy. I know there's a lot of work that goes with that. Um, so just stick with it. And she was really moved by that. You know, she was really thankful that it wasn't, and it wasn't just like a rental experience. It's not just, you know, you're my guest and I'm the host. You know, I really try to bring a personal experience when I can to each guest. And she checked out this past Saturday and she said that she was going to be coming back the following week and she would love to stay at one of my properties. The one that she stayed at was not available, but I did have another unit that was available and she's going to check in tomorrow and they're going to check in for three nights. And it becomes, you know, more of a, a friendship, so to speak, even though I've never met, never seen her or anything like that. Um, so that's that's really powerful to me. You know, that's the reason that I really enjoy this business is because I get to host people that are on vacation. They're here for just a great time. But then people that are here for real life stuff um, that happens. So if I can provide them with a safe, clean, um, comfortable place for them to stay, that means a lot to me and from and to them. 
you know. Uh, you know, I really like that you shared that because it, it, you know, especially with when when we're talking like on our other show, Vacation Rental Machine, we're always talking about like automation, but we talk about the hospitality and, and it, it really goes in hand in hand. But I really like what you made a point is that it, it can't just be fully automated because you would have missed something right there. Uh, that that point to be able to relate with someone, to be able to add that human touch where, you know, maybe she wasn't expecting that or maybe she wasn't looking for that. But because you were able to provide that that human aspect, you're never going to get that any anywhere else. A hundred percent. Yep. I agree with that. So, yeah, I mean, that's a typical day coordinating housekeeping, um, taking care of all that, making sure all the payments get sent out, making sure my housekeepers get paid on time. Oh, there's there's lots that goes goes along with it. Um, but it's all fun. I mean, it's all great. I wouldn't have it any other way. I have worked as an employee before and I've worked for some great companies and I've worked for some good companies and I work for some not so good companies. So I know what it's like and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. The fact that I have freedom, um, that's what success equals to me. The fact that if I wanted to go, my niece graduated from uh, UC Berkeley. The fact I don't have to ask anybody if I can go see her or go uh, see her for her graduation, or we did a family trip to Hawaii. I don't have to check with anybody on anything. Um, and if you have the right systems in place, if you have the right partners in place, and you treat people the way that you would like to be treated, you can be successful, not only in anything, but especially in short-term rental vacation. Um, so I wouldn't change anything in the world uh, with owning my own business and expansion. You know. You can grow it to whatever you envision it to be. However you, however big you want something to be, you can do it. And I think with the short-term rental business, that's, that's evident. You know, if you want to go out and get another rental arbitrage property, there's nothing stopping you. You can go do it. You just have to be persistent and it gives you freedom. I mean, there's not many people that can say, I want to go on vacation for a month or I want to go do this. They have to check. They have to check somebody. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, everybody has to start somewhere, have a job. But if you have an entrepreneurial spirit and you have a drive to want to become a business owner, I think that short term rentals is a great way to get started. And you never know where that might lead to. You know, that might lead into something else or something, something there. But you get started in it and your mind starts to, you know, you start to think differently. You start to think as an owner. You've been in the space for for a while now, you know, seven seven years, and you've you've seen the progression of Airbnb. You've seen the market grow. Are you not worried that there's a too much market interest, or that the, there's oversaturation, or all the new people that are coming into the space? Or uh, what what's your take on that? No, I'm not worried about it because I set a very high bar for myself and for my properties, and I think that the attention to detail that I give, I think that because it's that personal touch. None of us can be replicated. You know, Julian can't be replicated. The personal customer service that you give, that can't be replicated. That only belongs to you. And, you know, the customer service that I have, it can't be replicated. You know, so I think that so long as you can stand out, because so many people are getting involved in it, they're getting involved with it many times for the money side of it. And don't get me wrong. Money's great. You know, we all need money. We all want money. But if you're looking at it strictly from that perspective, which I think a lot of people get into it, they're like, oh, I can make how much return? Oh, I can make 100% or I can make 200%. I can get how much? They're just looking at the numbers. And that will eventually, over time, reflect in the reviews. Reviews are the bread and butter of any business nowadays, and especially vacation rental. So if somebody gets into it strictly for the money side of it, which I don't know what percentage that is, but let's just say half of people get into it just for the money side of it that's going to reflect in the reviews over time because there's not going to be the care. There's not going to be the response. There's not going to be those things that are in place. But the fact that I'm not in it solely for the money, but it's also providing experience. It's also to provide um, all those different things to my guests. I think that's what's going to make it different for me or for the next guy that does it that way or the next gal that goes that way. So I think competition is a great thing. Um, I really do. I always encourage people to, there's more than enough business out there for everyone. I don't feel like there's anything that's in short supply because you will always, the, the good will always rise to the top and everybody else will kind of plateau and there's going to be certain people that get out of it. Um, so competition is there, but it, what it's done is it's enhanced my business development. It's enhanced my eye. It's a, enhanced my uh, key to detail, all those things, listening to your program, all those things have really helped 
to say, like when we talked earlier, I just started using dynamic pricing. I never used it before. I started recently using it. I never used automation with Smart BNB. I started using it now. All of these things are investments that I have to grow. And I realize that because if I don't and everybody else is using it, where is it going to leave me? Um, so I think that saturation is there, but you can still do it. There's still an opportunity there. And you just have to see what makes you unique and what's different and then bring that to the table. Are you, because you, you are a, a real estate agent and you've been doing this for, for quite a long time, are you doubling down on the property management or are you um, uh, just holding the, the real estate there? Are you, are you playing with both? What, what's, how do you manage both of those? So with the property management, so far, it's just been word of mouth. It, it hasn't been something that I've actively been going out to seek or anything of that nature. That's something that for the new year, for 2020, that's definitely on my business plan to go out there and develop to do more of the property management. I'm open to that. Um, I think it's a great way to grow, to grow my business in a different way because I can't own all the real estate. I can't own everything. So it's better to go out there and help others. Um, so, so it's definitely something that I'm looking to grow. And as far as your, uh, your real estate background, are you uh, planning on still uh, actively pursuing that? Or is it because of, uh, sh- you know, short-term rentals and, and this type of, uh, you know, the business and the returns that you'd be more interested in going that way compared to traditional real estate uh, transactions? Sure. So traditional real estate, I will always have my real estate license. I'll always practice real estate because I love real estate. Right now, though, most of the business is going to be referral business, past clients, things of that nature, word of mouth. What I'm really looking to grow is the short-term rental side of it, whether that's through co-hosting, rental arbitrage, purchasing properties. That's where I really envision myself is delving even more so into that space. And then the real estate side of it will play a key factor because there are going to be people that are looking for, to get into that space and I can help them purchase the property or sell the property, that, that type thing. What's your, what's your reasoning? Is it just because you enjoy the property management uh, Airbnb stuff or is it because it's more scalable? Um, I think it's both of those. It's definitely more scalable. I enjoy it a lot more. Um, sometimes with the real estate side of it, while I, that is my background, that's what I've done. I, I like new challenges. You know, it's something that um, when I, I started, like I said, 2005, so I've been doing it now for about 14, 15 years. And it's something that I've enjoyed, but I want something new. I want something that's different. And that's what the short-term rental space has really brought to me. And, and what would you do if you did have to start from scratch? Mm-hmm. If I had to start from scratch, number one thing would be don't overanalyze anything too much. Uh, just get started. I have done that so many times where the opportunity then passes by. Because by nature, I am very conservative. Um, so I would say just get started. That's number one. I think number two is try to find the right partners as soon as possible. Cleaning service, uh, handyman, that type thing. Try to get that. Try to get the help. Ask for the help. I would say also educate yourself. Um, you know, I wasn't in 2012. I wasn't watching YouTube videos or anything like that on the space. 2013. I wasn't, I wasn't doing any of that type of stuff. It was just me coming up with these ideas. Oh, I think that would be a good idea. So I think seeking help, asking the right questions, seeking people that have been where you want to be and reaching out to them, asking that. Usually people are very helpful. You know, usually people are going to do that. I'd say that's going to be key. And then also just having the confidence to know that if this is something that you want to do, you're going to be successful in it. You know, everybody's going to be a little scared or insecure when they first start anything new. But with enough practice, enough time, you can get there. And your partners, treat your partners well. Your cleaning staff, uh, your cleaning partners, your handyman, all of those things. Treat them well. Treat them with respect um, because they are going to be and they are the bread and butter of what it is that you do. And if they care about your property, it's going to be because they care about you. If you're just saying, I'm going to pay you 75 bucks for cleaning, go do my job, go do the cleaning because I don't want to do it. If you look at it with that attitude, they can see that they will know that. So treat your partners well, treat your guests well, be customer centric. Um, You know, those are all just a few things that I can think of off the top of my head in order to be successful in the space. I know you mentioned uh, quite a a few things, but if you could give one piece of advice who's looking to get started uh, into this business, what, what would that be? Start today. That would be my advice. Um, if you're doing rental arbitrage, 
you might be scared, go to an apartment house. Tell them what you want to do. Just get started. Just because what's going to happen is it's going to become easier. When when you wait too long, you become scared, the opportunity passes. So just just go do it. That's that's what I would recommend, you know, if you're getting started in that space. And because you have you you have done all, all the models, you've done the home share, you've done the arbitrage, co-hosting, owning. Um where where do you see would be best fit for people that are just getting in, into the space? I think if you're just getting started and you have an opportunity, an extra room, I think a shared space in your personal space would be a great way to start. Um, the reason is because you're already there. And so long as you're comfortable with new people in your home, trust me, Airbnb people, everybody's good. You know, 90, those horror stories that you hear, that's exactly what they are. They're horror stories that happen every once in a while. It is not the truth um, as far as what the standard is, what it is. So as you mentioned, I do co-host, um, I'm sorry, I do have a shared space in my home. I have a five bedroom home and I rent out two rooms during the uh, peak season. I rent out an upstairs bedroom and bathroom and a downstairs bedroom and bathroom. And in a year during the peak season, I have about 60 different guests that come into my home. Everyone has been great. You know, you meet new people, you have some experiences that you get to talk about. And most of the time, they're just going to be out and about. They don't want to hang out there at your house most of the time. They just want a place that's, you know, clean, they can get a good night's rest, and then they're out sightseeing. So if you're just getting started, if you have an extra room or an extra space, I'd say throw it on Airbnb um, and, and rent that out as a shared space. That way you're going to get used to having customers. You're going to get used to having people come into your space, what their questions are. I think that would be an excellent way to get started and help to offset your mortgage and or rent. And going off of that, is there is there a house rule that you've started including uh, from all of the guests that you've had that you um, that you wouldn't leave without? That I wouldn't leave without? Um, I would say yes. I am a big, strict no smoking. Um, that's something that you can't smoke inside my home or in the backyard. So that's a rule that I have. Um, not only for my own personal home, but also for all my rental properties. My number one house rule is no smoking uh, because I don't want the place to smell like smoke. I want to be able to advertise it to people that it's a non-smoking home. I can't tell you how many guests have told me, oh, I chose your home because it was non-smoking. Um, so I think that would be the number one rule for me. No smoking, no drug use, that type of stuff. And what's a question that that you have maybe for someone that's in a similar place than you or maybe the next step in your progression uh, for scaling? Uh, what's a question that you would ask them? I'd want to know, because I've been fortunate enough to buy the properties cash, how do you really scale as far as if you want to use leverage? I know there's hard money lenders and things of that nature out there. But what would be their their recommendation as far as using leverage to get, let's say, like a four unit place? Because that's something that's also been on my mind is getting like a triplex or a four unit or a six unit place that's all in one. And I can run it just as an Airbnb. So you have the economies of scale with being able to have housekeeping all there. So that's something I'd really be interested in knowing. How do you get that leverage? Um, what do they recommend as far as getting it? And then also the aspect, what people that are running four unit, three unit, six unit places, what would their advice be on getting those properties and maintaining them well? What amenities would they provide um, if you have that space? Would you get a pool? Would you put in a pool? I think that's something that I'd be interested in hearing from somebody that has um, more experience than I do. Awesome. Well, th thank you so much. And is there is there anything that you're doing now, uh, like any books that you're listening to or books that you listen? <laughs> yeah, I, you can tell I, I only listen to audiobooks. But are there any books that you're reading or are things that you're following uh, or something that has really changed you before? Yeah. Um, as far as things that I'm doing. Um, I'm listening to more podcasts. Um, a great podcast that I've listened to is How I Built This, um, which is through NPR, uh, Guy Raz. And I think it, it's something that I started listening to over the last year or so. And it's been great because I can listen to it when I'm at the gym. I can listen to it when I'm driving. And what he does is he interviews different people, just like what you're doing. And it's people from all different types of walks of life. He's interviewed people from Burt's Bees to Mark Cuban. Uh, the guy that started Dyson uh, Vacuums, he has dozens of people that he's interviewed. And listening, and it's usually, the podcast usually anywhere between like 30 to 60 minutes. So it's not that much time. And it's really interesting to hear 
where they started, where they were at, where they're going. And it's really inspirational for me. You know, it doesn't seem like it, but it's like, okay, I can listen to the guy that started Dyson Vacuum. How does that relate to me? Because everybody usually, they have these rejections. They have these no's. They have these things. It's very, it's very far and few in between that things start off 100% right. And I remember one thing I listened to a podcast with Mark Cuban. And the guy asked him, one of the things he asked him at the end of each podcast is, do you think that your success comes by about by luck? Or is it just through you and your hard work and ingenuity? Which one would you recommend? Or which one would you say? And Mark Cuban said, you have to be lucky to be a billionaire, in his opinion. He, he sold his company at the right time. It was at the peak, you know, so to Yahoo or whatever. He said, you have to be lucky to be a billionaire. But you take it all away tomorrow and I can be a millionaire, like no doubt. He said, what I would do is I'd have a sales job in the daytime. I'd be a bartender at night. And in the evening time, I'd work on my own plan. Those would be the three things that he would do. So I kind of agree with that. I think that you have to be pretty lucky, kind of like win the lotto to be a billionaire. But I think anyone can become a millionaire. It's attainable. It's achievable. And I think that if you, you work hard, you go at it. Um, you can definitely do it. So I'd say listen to more podcasts. I, I, I think that would be my recommendation. Wow. Thank, thank you so much, Joel. I, I just want to comment. I, I think you just have such a wonderful personality. You're very, uh, very bright and very warm. You even have the sun shining down in your face right now. It's it, but, uh, thank you so much. You, you've shared so much, uh, really golden, uh, information in this episode. If anybody does want to reach out to you, if they have any questions or if they're maybe looking, uh, in the Phoenix area, what's the best way to be able to reach you? Yeah. Um, you can, Oh, my cell phone number, if you want that, it's 602-688-4059. I hope I don't get blown up too much now. But, That's uh, dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> or my uh, email, um, my email is joeledwards27 at gmail.com. So I'm pretty open. Awesome. If anybody has any questions, just let me know. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much, Joel, again, for, uh, for taking the time. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Hope you host benefited from the show. If you found value, please go on over to iTunes, leave us a review, and let us know what you enjoy about the show. If you'd like to talk to hosts that have been featured in these episodes as well as the community, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. 